So last time we introduced this concept of center of mass as the sort of the average location of the mass of an object or a system of masses. So that if you had a system of individual point masses at different uh, position vectors, it's sort of a weighted average of the position of the mass. So you multiply the mass at each position by the position vector, add all of those together, and then divide by the total mass, and that gives you the position of the center of mass. And what we showed was that if we consider the uh, uh, velocity of the center of mass, then it's the total momentum divided by the total mass. And so if we've got a system where the total momentum is constant and does not change, then the velocity of the center of mass also does not change, right? Now, another way you can think about that is if you uh, think of Newton's uh, 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 second law, if you've got a system of masses, they might be bouncing around and interacting with each other, but if there's no external force applied to that system, then Newton's second law says that there's no acceleration. In other words, the velocity is constant. Well, Newton's first law, no external force means that a body continues at rest or motion with a constant velocity. So really, this is just a restatement of that, that the velocity of the center of mass remains constant if the momentum remains constant, because for the momentum to remain constant, there has to be no external force, right? We have this relationship, um, Get going. We have this relationship from Newton's second law that force is equal to dp by dt. So if there's no external force, uh, it implies that p is constant. And so therefore, you would expect uh, no external force also means velocity is constant. Of course, it does not mean that the velocity of each individual mass in a system is constant. It just means the total you know, uh, velocity of the center of mass of the system is constant, right? So there is a subtle difference there. You know, interactions between masses inside the system are not external forces, but will accelerate one mass or slow down another, right? So you can still have components of the system changing their velocity or, or their momentum, but the overall system itself, if it has a constant momentum, the velocity of the center of mass is also constant. Okay, and then we did this, uh, 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 briefly covered this right at the end of the lecture, which was we went back to the example we did with the uh, golf club and the ball and showed that the velocity of the center of mass before the collision was equal to the velocity of the center of mass after the collision, even though we weren't worrying about that uh, uh, at the time. So, and it didn't matter what type of collision, elastic, inelastic, doesn't make any difference. Velocity of the center of mass is still the same. Okay, so now first click a question. So we've got a, a yellow block and a red rod, and these have uniform density, and they're joined together sort of like this. The center of mass of the combined system is marked where the X is, right? So the center of mass of the combined system is exactly where they uh, uh, touch. Which of the separate two parts, the rod and the block, has the largest mass? The rod, the block, both of them have the same mass, or I haven't told you enough information to be able to calculate it. Okay, so uh, oh, that's interesting. So we have, a, we have a bit of a distribution. So uh, uh, B, C, and D seem to be the favorite ones. So uh, turn to your neighbor and try and convince them that you've got the, uh, the right answer. Okay, so we better have another vote and see where people are. Wow, C has increased. So, um, okay, it's the first time this is, it's, uh, it's not necessarily working so well. So I'll show you the right answer and then tell you why it's the right answer. B is the right answer. <laughs> right? It is the block has the larger mass. They do not have equal masses. Okay, so why, why is that? So what we've got to remember is, is our, our definition, definition of center of, of mass, mass right? right? So we, so we had center of mass, mass
is equal, equal to the sum of the masses times the position of the masses divided by the total number of masses. So this is our position of the center of mass. So if, so if we, we look at this system, system here, what we've got, got is we've got, got a block and we've, and we've got, got a long rod. rod. So, so if, if we just, just look at the block, block right, we're, told we're told it's a uniform, uniform density, density, which means the, the, the mass is uniformly distributed, distributed throughout, throughout the, uh, the block. block. So, if so if we look at the block, we can, we can see, see I think everybody, everybody will agree, agree the central, central mass block is in the middle of the block, right? right? Nobody, Nobody would disagree, disagree with that. that. Yeah? yeah? Good. Good. Okay. okay. So, so this, this is, is the center, center of mass of the block. And the center, center mass of mass of the rod, I hope everybody would agree, is, is in the middle, middle of the rod. Right? right? So, so this, this is the mass, mass of the rod here, here and this, and this is, is the center, center of mass, mass of the rod. rod. Right? right? So, so if, if I, look I look at this formula here, here for our definition of the center of, the center of mass, mass, and I, and I look, look at these two masses here, here if, if the actual position of the center of mass of the combined system, so this is the combined center, center of, of mass, mass. Then, then this is clearly a lot nearer, nearer to, the to the position of the block mass, center of mass, mass than it is to the rod center of mass. And if, and I, if look I look at my definition, definition here, I mean, if, if these masses were equal, equal right, right, then, then I, would I would be, if, 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 if equal, Then, then what, what I'd be doing is, is I'd be taking the mass of the, uh, so these equal masses, masses. So, I'd so I'd take mass times the position of the block, block plus, plus mass, mass times the uh, position of the rod, and I'd, and I'd, be, I'd dividing be dividing by two times the mass, mass, which would be this, this. And, so and so what I'd end up with is I'd end up with a half of the position of the block plus the position of the Central, central mass, mass of the rod, of the rod. And, this, and this of course would then be the average of those, those two positions, positions. but the but average of these two central masses is about, about here, here because, because the rod is longer, longer than, the than the block. So the central, so the central mass, mass of the rod is further away, away from the point, point of contact, contact than, than the central, central mass, mass of the block because of the shapes of the two objects. objects right? right? So, so if you look at this, you can, you can see, see that, that for the two, two masses, masses to be equal, equal you'd, have you'd have to have it uh, uh, somewhere into the rod, rod would be the center of mass. mass. The fact, the fact that, that the center of mass happens, happens to be at this junction here between, between the, two the two means, means that it's nearer, nearer the center, the center of mass of the block, block. Which, means which means the center of mass of the block, block has a bigger, bigger weight when we, when we take the averaging. And the only way that could be the case is if the mass of the block is bigger than the mass of the rod. Right? Does that, Does that make sense, sense to, everybody? to everybody? Right. right. You're doing, You're doing an, an averaging of the positions of the, positions of the two centers of masses of the, of the object to together, together. And, because and because the combined center of mass is nearer, nearer one, of one, one of those two objects than the other, it means, it means this must have, have a bigger weight in the, in the averaging process, and so, and so therefore, therefore that means this has, this has a bigger, bigger mass. mass. Right. So, so the, reason the reason I ask this is because it is very counterintuitive. Right. The first right? time everybody sees this, they immediately think, well, they must be equal because it's where they join. They join. But, it's but it's not. not. And, the and the reason is, is because the rod has got, has got a longer dimension, dimension and the central mass of the rod is further away from where, from where the two objects join than the central mass of the block. block. And so, and therefore, the two do not have equal masses if the central mass is where they join. Right. If they, if they were both equal dimensions in the center of mass where they joined, they joined then, you'd then you'd be right. Be right. But, because but because one has got longer, longer in one dimension, dimension it's, it's not, not the case, case because, because of the way, of the way they're, they're average. Okay. So, last thing we're, we're going to do is um, in, in collisions and impulse and momentum is how we actually measure the coefficient of restitution. Right? So, and this is also a particular, a, a special type of collision. It's when things collide with walls, right? Or uh, photons bounce off. I think there was an example on one of the uh, past exams where we had photons bouncing off a mirror uh, and you had a change of momentum there. It's the same sort of thing. So when we're doing this sort of uh, 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 collision, then we cannot use constant momentum. 
because what we're assuming here is that the ball is bouncing off the ground. Now, if we could measure the momentum change or the change in the velocity of the uh, planet, then you're right, we could do constant momentum and, and treat it as a collision between the Earth and the ball. Um, however, since the uh, Earth's mass is about 10 to the 24 kilograms and the ball is one, um, you know, the effect is, is not measurable. You don't notice the Earth shake every time a ball bounces off it. So, in these cases, what we assume is we assume the ground is immovable. In other words, we assume that the, at this point there's an external force being applied to the ground to keep the ground from moving, right? So, at this point, it becomes uh, 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 hard to uh, uh, use constant uh, momentum. However, our definition for the coefficient of restitution still holds, right? Because that is reliant on the properties of the materials that are colliding. It's not reliant on constant momentum. So what we can do is we've got a, a situation where we have the ball coming in to the ground. And before the collision, the ball has a velocity v downwards. And the ground, of course, is not moving. And after the collision, the ground, of course, is still not moving. And now the velocity that the ball has is v prime. So notice we're not going to be using constant momentum because clearly the momentum is not constant, right? The ground stays immobile, and the velocity and the momentum of the ball changes direction. So we have non-constant momentum. But if we look at this, we can still define our coefficient of restitution because that's not dependent on constant momentum. So we have the relative velocity of separation. Well, that's v prime minus 0 divided by the relative velocity of approach. Well, that's v minus 0, right? And so therefore, our coefficient of restitution is the ratio of the incoming velocity, uh, the outgoing velocity, to the incoming velocity. Right? And since when you drop a ball, it tends to bounce lower and lower each time, this, of course, tells you that the coefficient of restitution is less than 1, uh, but greater than 0. Because if it was 0, it would be like dropping a beanbag. Right? You drop the beanbag, and it just goes splat on the floor, because the rebound velocity is 0. If you drop something like a tennis ball, each time it bounces, or one of those super bouncy balls, each time it bounces, it bounces to a lower height. Um, and so that tells you that the coefficient of restitution is not quite 1, um, but it's, it's certainly more than zero. And so the question now comes, how do we measure the ratio of those two uh, velocities? Well, I already gave you the hint there. What we can do is we can simply use our constant acceleration equations all the way back from the, the start of the course. And we know that when we've got an object with, uh, we've got our object here now, our ball, it's got a constant acceleration g in the downwards direction, uh, what we're going to do is we want to know the height it reaches after bouncing. So we drop it from a particular height. We can measure how high it bounces uh, uh, after that. And so we know uh, the initial velocity. Well, that's the velocity that we uh, release it, uh, that it bounces off the floor with. So we know that. Final velocity, we know that because it's equal to 0 at the maximum height that it bounces to. The acceleration we know, because it's equal to uh, g, or minus g, uh, depending on which way we're going to take as positive, uh, so probably minus g. Um, and then we have the displacement that we want to know, because that gives us the maximum height, and the time we don't care about. So if you put those variables together, the equation you get is v squared equals v naught squared plus 2as. And since our final velocity is 0, we've got a negative acceleration. If we take upwards as positive, we end up with that um, v is equal v uh, naught is equal to root 2gh. And so what we can do is we also know, if we do this in reverse, that also gives us the velocity, the initial velocity. So if we drop it from a height h, the final velocity it hits the ground with is root 2gh. Then it bounces, comes back with a velocity v prime, and it will go up to root 2gh prime. And so what we can do is we can put this in, into our equation that we just calculated for the uh, coefficient of restitution, so this one here. 
and v prime now becomes root 2gh prime, and v itself is root 2gh, and so that gives us the coefficient of restitution is h prime over h square rooted. And so that gives us the means that we can use to measure the coefficient of restitution between two objects, right? You put one, uh, you, you make one a surface on the floor, you make the other a ball if you can, and you bounce it like that, and you measure the height of the rebound and the height that you dropped it from, take the square root of that ratio, and you get the coefficient of restitution. So this is a way that you can actually measure the coefficient of restitution uh, of two materials, uh, and you can then use that for your uh, 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 collisions. Okay, so any questions before we move on? Yeah. Pardon? Oh, okay, S in this is the maximum height of the bounds. Sorry, so this is, uh, so S is equal to the maximum height of the bounds. You measure how high it bounces, so when it stops moving further up. Okay, good. So, so how many of you done rigid body motion before, rotations and things? So a handful of you, right? So for most of you, this is where we finally have uh, departed from what you did at school and, uh, and, and are moving into something new, All right? So all we've dealt with so far, I mean, we have dealt a little bit with rigid bodies, but the only thing we've ever discussed so far is linear motion, right? So we talked about accelerations in one and two dimensions, but nevertheless, it was linear. It was in a line. It might have been a curved line if we were doing it in two or three dimensions. We did circular motion, which, of course, is curved. Um, but it was motion in a line. Now, once you've got a rigid object, you've got more degrees of freedom than just linear motion. I can be moving in a line, but I can also spin, right? If you've seen the figure skating uh, at the Olympics uh, uh, earlier this year, right? You've got figure skaters moving across the ice, and they spin as they go. And so they're uh, uh, an example of a, uh, well, OK, maybe not rigid because they can move, but it's uh, 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 an object with finite dimensions spinning and moving in a straight line as well. And so far, all we've ever dealt with is moving in a straight line. So you, know, you can explain how they managed to skate in a straight line and the, the physics of that, but the moment they start spinning, we've got to start being very, very careful. So what we have, what we're going to end up with, is a, a parallel with one-dimensional kinematics. So all the constant acceleration equations and things like that, we're going to revamp these now for rotational motion. So obviously, when we're talking about rotation, the, the linear things like linear displacement, velocity, and so on aren't going to work. Instead, once you're rotating, what you measure, of course, is an angle. And so the angle that you rotate through. And so instead of having a displacement as a distance in meters, what we're now going to have is a displacement being an a angle. So the number of radians that you turn through. That's the other difference is, is that when we do these things, we need to use natural dimensionless units. And that means we use radians for our angles. You may have questions that give you angles in degrees or even ask for an answer in degrees. But in that case, you have to convert. You have to do all the equations. The numbers you put into the equations must be in radians. And then you do the conversion to degrees at the end, or you do the conversion from degrees to radians to start with, do it, and then convert it back. So, uh, uh, so that's the first thing, because we need to use dimensionless uh, units and degrees, while the dimensionless have a constant in front of them. Radians are a ratio of meters to meters, and so cancel out. So we have a velocity, well, if our displacement of velocity in linear case is uh, meters per second, so if we have an angular displacement, we've got an angle rotated through per second, so that will be radians per second. And then similarly, we, instead of acceleration, we're going to have to have the rate of change of angular velocity, and so that gives us an angular acceleration. So there are going to be a few differences, though, right? Because a displacement is an angle, and it's not a distance. 
So if I set off in a straight line in that direction, I will never get back to where I started. In fact, we know that now because we've, uh, uh, the recent results from the WMAP probe from NASA have shown that the universe's acceleration is expanding. Um, before that, we might have lived in a closed universe, and so if I'd have set off in that direction, you know, my great-great-great-great-grandchildren may have come back to where I started. Um, but now we know the universe is not closed, and so if you set off in a straight line, um, you will not end up back where you started. But with angular displacement, of course, you do, a lot quicker than you would with the universe. Right? So uh, with angular displacement, if you set off, uh, if you rotate through uh, two pi radians, or 360 degrees, you end up exactly uh, back where you started. Right? And so that's worth bearing in mind, um, because that sometimes uh, uh, comes into the uh, um, questions. The other thing is here is that like the one-dimensional case, I said one-dimensional kinematics, well, in one-dimensional kinematics, you can have positive displacements or negative displacements. So in this case, obviously, if you displace far enough, you get back to where you started. So here, the sign just gives what direction you're rotating in, so clockwise or anti-clockwise or counterclockwise, whatever you prefer for the non-clockwise version. Right? So the sign gives you whether you're rotating clockwise or anti-clockwise. It doesn't tell you anything else. Right? It just tells you which uh, direction you're going, with the clock or against the clock. OK, so radians, just a quick refresher. I think we covered that. There was one spurious uh, slide uh, when we were talking about rotational uh, uniform uh, circular motion. This is just to revamp it. The angle in radians is the arc length divided by the radius of the circle. So. If I've got an angle here, right, this angle theta, if this is the radius here and s is the arc length, then theta is equal to the arc length divided by the radius. Right? And that is the definition of the angle in radians. Arc length of the circle subtended at the center divided by the radius of the, uh, 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 of the circle. So that are, those are the units that we will use in all of our equations. If you use degrees, you will get the answer wrong. And the reason for that is, is that radians have this natural meters divided by meters. So there's no co you know, the constant term associated with them is 1, because uh, you want something that's dimensionless. If you were doing this in degrees, then you'd have this uh, uh, you know, 360 divided by 2 pi factor, which you have to take out. Right? Because that's a, a, it's an artificial construct to, to use 360 as the uh, number of degrees in a full rotation. So remember to convert either to or from degrees, depending on, on what the question is asking for. If you don't, then, then you will end up getting things wrong. And this is also the SI unit for angles, in fact, radians. And the official abbreviation is RAD, R-A-D. OK, so angular displacement, well, this isn't hard to define. It's the angle that you rotate for. Um, but clearly, this is, we're not just going to use the effective angle that you've rotated for. So if you take a CD uh, and it spins around in the period that you're looking at it, uh, you know, it does 10 revolutions, the you know, angular displacement is not 0. Yes, it gets back to where it started from, so effectively the CD hasn't moved. But when you're talking about angular displacements, it has rotated through 10 revolutions, and so therefore it's rotated through an angle of 20 pi. Right? So you can't just divide, you don't just take the, the total number of revolutions and divide by 2 pi uh, for the angular displacement. You want to know how many times it's rotated because clearly that's going to make a, a, a difference, right? Because it'll tell you how fast it's rotating. If you say, well, it hasn't moved at all, then it's, it's as far as you're concerned, if you put an angular displacement of zero down, then it hasn't moved and it's not rotating at all, right? So you've got to actually put the total angle spun through, and that can be more than one revolution, right? So that's the definition of angular displacement. So if we've got an angular displacement, if you remember in the linear case, we had our uh, linear velocity was change in position divided by time. So we had v here, our average v, was change in 
uh, position divided by our change in time, right? So if we go to the angular case, we want an average angular velocity, and that's going to be, well, displacement, we have the change in angle. So that's our angular displacement divided by the time it takes to do it. And so we end up with the average angular velocity being the angular displacement divided by the time, right? And that tells us how fast we are rotating, just like velocity tells us how fast we're moving in a straight line. So of course, we can do just as we did with velocity. So if we started with our average uh, um, uh, velocity, what we did to get the instantaneous velocity is we said that our velocity vector was the limit as delta t goes to zero of um, uh, uh, delta s by delta t, which is just ds or dx, whatever you want, by dt. And that gives you the velocity vector. Well, we can do exactly the same here. We can say that our instantaneous angular velocity is the limit as delta t goes to zero of the change in angle divided by the change in time. And so that equals d theta by dt. Now, I'm also going to uh, introduce another notation here because you commonly see this when dealing with rotations. In fact, physicists also use it when dealing with linear displacements as well, but that's somewhat less common. And this is the, so, so the typical notation we use when differentiating d theta by dt is the notation that Leibniz came up in his version of calculus, because it's a lot more explicit. It tells us we're differentiating theta with respect to t. But Newton, who came up with calculus at the same time, developed a, he was interested in developing it for exactly the sort of problems that we're dealing with here, mechanics. And so as far as he was concerned, he was always differentiating with respect to t. So he didn't want to write in d theta by dt all the time. What he did was he wrote it by putting a dot over the top of it. So theta dot means d theta by dt. And as we'll see in a minute, when you do the second differentiation, you put two dots over the top. So it becomes theta double dot. And you can also use this for displacement. So you can write uh, um, v as being x dot. Uh, that you see less frequently. But I am going to introduce this because simply because you may well encounter it in textbooks. Some textbooks still use it. I'm not, I think even your textbook uh, deals with it a little bit. Certainly the optional textbook covers it, and a lot of other texts use it as well. So I'm just going to introduce it so that you're familiar with the notation. It's not just to add another notation to confuse you. It's because this is one that is in common use, and you will encounter, right? The Leibniz notation is definitely the better notation because it explicitly tells you what you are differentiating um, with respect to what, which is why that is the one that we use the most. But when it comes to Newton, uh, when it comes to mechanics, uh, it's quite often we'll use uh, Newton's, uh, Newton's, uh, Newton's notation. Uh, um, and notation is something we'll deal with later with gyroscopes. Uh, so Newton's notation uh, uh, to denote acceler angular accelerations and angular velocities because it's a bit of a shorthand, right? And physicists don't like writing. Okay, so that's angular uh, velocity. Oh, last thing to mention, of course, is that you've got an angle, d theta, in radians. dt is in seconds, and so therefore angular velocity is in radians per second. So rad s to the minus 1. Okay, so if you were noticing, I kept putting little arrows over the tops of things here, and that is because angular velocity is a vector, right? It has a direction, just like angular displacement, and in fact, when we deal with it, angular acceleration, right? These are vector quantities. Now, clearly, we can't use the same convention that we use for normal linear velocity, because if I've got a rotating disk, it doesn't make sense. You know, I, if I've got a rotating disk like this, right, then 
this point may be rotating with this way, this point's moving with this direction, so I can't use a normal linear velocity simply because there is no common linear velocity for the disk, right? Each point has a different uh, velocity vector on the disk. So what we do instead is we have a convention where we put the uh, uh, velocity vector, the, ac the angular velocity vector, goes along the axis of rotation. So, and the direction it goes is if you use your right hand, even left-handed people, I'm afraid you have to use your right hand, and you curl your fingers in the direction of rotation, your thumb will point in, along the axis in the correct direction for the vector, right? So this is the convention that we use. I mean, we could have used the left hand, uh, a left-handed one as a convention, but there's more right-handed people than left-handed people, so I'm afraid uh, uh, left-handed people lost out. And um, we use our fingers, um, thumb points in the direction. But we all have to use the same convention, otherwise we will get answers wrong, right? So apologies to those of you who are left-handed. Uh, uh, you just have to put up with this, I'm afraid. So curl the fingers of your right hand, your thumb points along the axis in the right direction for the axial velocity vectors and displacement vectors, and in fact, uh, uh, angular acceleration vectors as well. Okay, so first question. So we've got the London Eye is the world's largest uh, big wheel, Ferris wheel, whatever you want to call it, and it makes one revolution in 1,200 seconds, so it's not exactly fast. What is its average angular velocity? Right, so what is the average angular velocity for the London Eye? And those are your options. We've got D. Bingo, excellent, okay. So D is indeed the right answer. So why is that the case? Well, you've got this big wheel, it takes 120, so it takes 120, uh, sorry, 1,200 uh, seconds to make a complete revolution, and the angle for a complete revolution in radians is 2 pi radians, and so therefore the angular, average angular velocity is 2 pi divided by 1,000, oops, can't write this morning, 1,200, and so of course that is equal to pi over 600 radians per second. So the right answer was uh, D. Okay, so supposing we have an object now though that rotates through an angle um, given by this where theta is 3t squared plus 4t minus 3. In this case, what is its instantaneous angular velocity? Ah, bingo. Okay, that one, that one I didn't need to ask you, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> um, okay, so the right answer is indeed, it will come as no surprise. C is the right answer. So all you did there, well, most of you did it, um, was you start off with theta as being uh, 3t squared plus 4t minus 3, and we just differentiate that. It's d theta by dt, and so we end up with 6t plus 4 as the differential, right? So we're not integrating, we're uh, differentiating. Okay, so, well, let's just, we, we can calculate, for example, uh, uh, an everyday example is what is the angular velocity of the Earth around the Sun? We're going in a roughly circular case, okay, it's not perfect, but it's actually very, very good. It's very low eccentricity. The orbital period is 36, uh, 365.25 days. Uh, the extra 0.25 is why we have a leap year every uh, four years. And there's an extra one, it's not quite 2.5, which is why every, 400 year, uh, every 100 year, unless it's divided by 400, we don't have a leap year. Um, so 2000 was, was a one in 400 year event uh, where you have a leap year on a year divisible by uh, 100. 
Um, so we can use our simple definition of angular velocity, right? We're calculating the average angular velocity. So the total angle that we go through is 2 pi radians, and we go through that in one year. So we convert one year into uh, seconds, so number of days times 24 times 3,600, and we find that the angular velocity of the Earth around the sun is uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 7 radians per second, or 0.2 uh, micro radians per second. So as an angular velocity is not very large, when you multiply it out by the, uh, the lever arm of 150 million kilometers, uh, it's actually uh, quite significant in terms of uh, uh, linear velocity at any instant uh, in time, you know, tens of kilometers per second. Okay, so this period is something we talked about before. If we've got an object that's moving now around in a circle, we've got rotational motion, then we define the period as the amount of time it takes to rotate through one revolution, so through 2 pi uh, radians. So if our angular velocity is the change in angle divided by time, then so our angular velocity is delta theta over delta t. If delta theta is equal to 2 pi, uh, then the time it takes to do that is what we call our period t, and so therefore we can just rearrange that, and we get that the period t is uh, simply 2 pi divided by the angular velocity for constant angular velocity, right? If it's not a constant angular velocity, things get more complicated, but for a constant angular velocity, it's simple to define uh, the period. And then the other thing we want to be able to do is relate are angular velocities to linear velocities. So if we look, look at this, this supposing, supposing I've got a, a turntable turn here, here, and, and I've got, got uh, some, some object sitting, sitting uh, on the turntable, turn and the turntable turn is rotating with an angular velocity of omega, omega and I want, I want to know what is the linear uh, velocity, velocity at this instant, instant in time, what, what is, is the linear, linear velocity of this distance, distance of, of this object here that sat a distance, distance r away from the center of rotation? rotation. Well, well, if, if I, I look at this, this right, what, what I've got, got is I'm, I'm going to rotate through some, some after I've rotated through some angle theta, theta here, here, right? It's, it's this, this is the radius r. r. This arc length here is simply r times theta, theta. And, that and that comes from the definition of theta in radians, radians per second, right? right? Radi radi sorry, uh, in radians. A radian, a radian, radian is the arc length divided by the radius, so I just rearrange that, and we, and we get, get that the arc length is r times uh, uh, theta. theta. So, so this, this here is my displacement, so if I take a very, very tiny instant in time, this becomes delta s, this becomes delta, delta theta, theta and, and I, I get delta, delta s is equal to r delta theta, theta like, like this. this. And, and so, so now, now and this occurs in a time delta, delta t. So, so if, if I look at an object that's, that's sitting here and it moves around this arc length, the instantaneous velocity of this object is its change in displacement, which is going to be delta s, Divided, divided by, by delta, delta t. t. Well, well delta, delta s is, is just r delta, delta theta, theta divided, divided by delta, delta t. t. And, and then, then when I take the limit as delta, delta t goes to zero, what I'm, what I'm going to end up with is that the linear, linear velocity at an instant in time of this, of this object is simply r times d theta by, by dt, dt. Or, or more commonly r times omega. omega. Right? right, and so, and that, so that gives, gives me the linear, linear velocity of the object at an, at an instant, instant in time. time. I multiply the radius, the distance, the, distance the object is away from, from the axis of rotation, rotation by the angular, angular velocity, velocity, and that, and that will, will tell me the instantaneous, instantaneous linear, linear velocity, velocity of the object. Right, and so this is how we relate. This is going to be very important in a lot of questions because we'll have to relate linear velocities to angular velocities. And this is how we do it. It's the angular velocity times the distance from the axis of rotation. 
So, consider the two points A and B on a rigid spinning disk, as shown here. Which of these has the largest angular velocity? Whoa, okay. So we've got a 50-50 a, a split uh, between A and C. Okay, well, I, think, I don't think we've got time for the discussion session, so I will, I will leave you with a cliffhanger this lecture. Uh, so on uh, uh, Wednesday, come back, and uh, we'll do this again, see if anybody's changed their mind, and then I'll tell you what the, uh, the right answer is. So uh, see you all on Wednesday.